The reading today is from the book, the a book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. This chapter tells of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the discussions that took place in the temple between Jesus and the Pharisees. In this particular part of the chapter, the talk is about taxes. Listen for the word of God. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I have a little pop quiz for us this morning. We have some worship leaders in the sanctuary who can play along, you can play along at home. This game can be played by kids, adults, and people of all ages. So I have a coin in my hand, and I just brought one coin, one piece of, of currency today, and I'm going to see who knows what faces are on which coin. So let's start with a U.S. nickel. Who's on the face? Well, no, 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 no. Oh, no. Yeah, they can't see it yet. <laughs> Sorry, the face of the nickel. Who's on the nickel? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Good job, Sharon. How about the quarter? 25 cent piece. What's, who's on the quarter? George Washington. It's hard not to sing the, uh, Jeff the Hamilton songs in my head, right? Uh, what about a dollar bill? Who's on a dollar bill? Washington. Washington. Same thing. That's right. Okay. A five dollar bill. Abraham Lincoln. Good job. And a ten dollar bill. Hamilton. Hamilton. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton. That's right. Okay, I'm jumping up ahead. A thousand dollar bill. Never seen one before. Grover Cleveland. Yeah, exactly. Okay, what about, let's switch countries. What about a Canadian $20 bill? Who's on that one? Queen Elizabeth, that's right, there she is, Queen Elizabeth. What about um, in Thailand, the Thailand, the Thai bot? Any, any guesses? Lama. Hmm? Lama. The Dalai Lama, that's a good guess. Well, as of 2018, Thailand bot, B-A-H-T, banknotes of any amount have the new king, King Maha and I can't pronounce his last name, but there he is with his glasses. Looks like a friendly fella. So he is on almost all the Thai banknotes these days. Okay, so some money. Last question. Last question about money. 
Which ancient people group first started using coins for money? First started using coins for money. Gary says Syrians. Other guesses? Deanna wins with the Greeks. It was the Greeks, the people called the Lydians within Greece. They first started using coins in the 6th century B.C. And so that was a huge moment for human civilization. Being able to hold money in your hands was so much easier than uh, trading big smelly oxen or large bags of grain, right? You could just have a bag of coins or one coin, right? And from the very beginning, coins were made with the faces of kings and queens, heroes and heroines imprinted on them. Today, in the U.S., we have deceased U.S. presidents and founding fathers like Alexander Hamilton, who was never a president, but he was a very important founding father, on our money. Other countries have current kings and queens and prime ministers um, on their money. In ancient Rome... The face, it was the face of the current emperor that was on the coins, like the denarius. The most common coin, which was worth a day's wage. It was the coin used for paying taxes to the Roman government. And when the emperor died, they could melt the coins down and mint new ones with the face of the new emperor on them. So what was the point of putting the faces on the coins? It was to mark the kingdom or empire from which the money came, or from which the money comes, because we still do it today, the kingdom to which the money and the people who spend it belong, and having the faces on the money, on the coinage, and now today the bills, marks the kingdom to which portions of the money return in order for the kingdom to function. Does that make sense? That system, right? So it probably comes as no surprise to any of us that people have always, in every time and place, had mixed feelings about giving money to their government. Quick check in, check in with your body right now when I say the word taxes. How do you feel? How do you feel in your body when I say the word taxes? Yeah, we all kind of have a different response, don't we? So it was no different in the ancient Roman world, especially for the Jewish people who were an occupied people. Rome occupied Jewish lands and controlled them. So they were under Jewish or under Roman rule and subject to Roman taxes. Um, <clears throat> many Jews found themselves asking the question, should the people of God give money to and so support an idolatrous and religiously debased state and its cult of emperor worship? That was a fair question. Should we give money to this? And a group of Jewish people called the Zealots thought not. They shouldn't do it. And so there were some Jews who refused to pay the Roman tax, and they left their towns, and they went into the hills, and became guerrillas of the guerrilla fighters, um, not the ape version of guerrillas, but the, the fighters um, in the hills against the Roman colonialists and any Jewish collaborators, anybody that was sympathetic to Rome and collaborating with Rome to collect those taxes and enforce Roman rules. So when Jesus got more and more popular with the people of Judea, 
Some thought perhaps he was a zealot. And as the religious leaders became more and more offended by his parables that were calling them out on their hypocrisy, they began to devise a plan to trap Jesus and expose him as a zealot who didn't pay taxes or possibly as a collaborator with Rome. That was their trap. So we may read that sentence that Sharon read for us. The Pharisees sent their disciples and the Herodians to talk to Jesus and think, no big deal, same team. But actually, they were not the same team on most days. Herodians were friends with the Roman political power. The Herods were the kings that were very much collaborating with Rome to subject the Jewish people. And then the Pharisees were friends of the Israelite religious power. So to the political right of the Herodians stood the Roman militia, ready with spears and swords to force submission to Rome. And to the political left of the piously nonviolent Pharisees stood the zealots, ready with their daggers to punish Roman collaborators. But that day they came together to trap Jesus. First they butter him up with some flattery, and then they ask him if it is right to pay taxes to Caesar. See, the trap is this. If he says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes to Rome, that would mark him as a zealot, and the Herodians could have the Roman soldiers arrest him for not paying taxes. If he says, yes, you should pay your taxes to Caesar, he sounds like a collaborator. And the Pharisees would let the zealots know Jesus supported Rome. And then they would either do away with Jesus or they would turn public opinion away from him. So they thought they had a foolproof plan. But uh, not so fast, guys. Jesus is about to spin them right back around. He says, well, show me that law coin or that tax coin you're talking about. Show me the tax coin, the denarius. In other words, Jesus is saying, I don't have one on me. Because carrying a Roman coin for some was seen even as complicit with Rome. And you made, made you unclean to carry a Roman coin. So Jesus is like, I don't have one. You guys have one? And yes, they do. So the guys who came to trap him, they actually have a coin. So that's one point for Jesus to say, well, I'm not carrying the coin that's so contentious, but you are. Okay, so that's his first point. And then he says, whose icon is it? Whose image is on there? And whose name is on it? And they said, Caesar. Caesar. Isn't this an awesome picture? Uh, This is an actual uh, Roman denarius. And this would have been the kind that Jesus was looking at that day. And the inscription, this is Caesar Tiberius. The inscription reads in Latin, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. Son of the divine Augustus. Yeah. So they ask if it's right to pay taxes to Caesar, and Jesus says, well then, if it's his to begin with, it has his face on it, it has his name on it, well then give it back to him. And this giving back acknowledges that there was a first, first a giving to. Where did this come from? It came from Caesar in the first place, so it's okay to give it back, give some of it back to him. So the first gift of Jesus' answer is respect for the state. He says respect the government. The state, the government, performs multiple services for its citizens, which it pays for with the coins that it produces and makes available to its people. So roads, water systems, sewage, defense. Consider the ancient Roman aqueducts, 
the highways, the buildings and infrastructures that still exist today, thousands of years later. Those were paid for by taxes collected from the people of the ancient world. Today, taxes are similarly collected in our own country and other countries meant for the common good. Things for the benefit of everyone. To similarly, roads, bridges, police, firefighters, schools, parks, and so on. So there is a grace about government, and it costs money to, to function. And so Jesus is saying it's okay to be part of this system, and, or to pay towards this. If this is the money that comes from Caesar, it's okay to give some of it back. So, but if the first part of Jesus' answer means honor the state, the second half of his answer speaks to the limitations of the state, the limitations of human government. He says, give back to God the things of God. God provides services to humanity through the state, the Roman government, the U.S. government, the Thai government. And through God's Son, God gives the mandate to give what is due your government, but not to deify your government. Do not make your government a god. Yes, give what is due in terms of money and taxes. That is responsible. And, and try to do it with a happy heart, even. But do not worship any human ruler. Any hu do not worship any president, flag, or form of government. This is idolatry, plain and simple. It is God alone who is to be worshipped. And so this is where Jesus shifts gears from the political to the spiritual. As Caesar's coin bears the image of Caesar and belongs to Caesar, so God's humanity bears God's image and belongs to God. You and I are God's coins in the world, so to speak. We bear the image of God and we belong to God. And we give back to God of our lives because they came from God in the first place. Amen? We are an offering. When we lift our voices in songs or in proclamation of the gospel or sharing our stories with others, we are giving back to God what is God's. We are an offering. When we give of our tithes and our offerings to the work of the church, when we sponsor a child in Senegal, West Africa, or in Mazatlan, Mexico, or somewhere else in the world, to help them and to feed them and to educate them, we are giving back to God what is God's. We are an offering. When we advocate for the rights of children stuck in systems of poverty, when we look for who's missing at the table of decision-making and invite them and listen to what they have to say, when we speak up and work for the human rights of refugees held in detention camps, we are God's coins, God's imaged people in the world being spent for God's work. We are an offering. When Jesus went to the cross. He was taken by Roman soldiers, paid their salaries paid by the taxes he said, yes, we should pay. The irony of that, that Jesus went to the cross as an offering, knowing that, it, that, he, uh, that he gave permission to support the financing of that. That boggles my mind. Here at Summit Avenue and in many churches right now, 
We are in what many people call stewardship season. October and November of each year, we look back at our year of ministry and give thanks to God for God's faithfulness. And we look ahead to the coming year and trust God to be faithful in the future. Even when, like this year, the future seems very uncertain and strange. But we do trust God with our offerings, with our lives, with our future. Stewardship letters and pledge cards will be going out in the mail later this week with details about our Stewardship Sunday on November 15th. We're pretty excited about it. And um, so we want you to be excited about that letter and be looking for that in the mail and mark your calendars November 15th for Stewardship Sunday. We are God's imaged people. From God we have come. To God we belong. And to God we offer back our lives, our time, our treasure. To the glory of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and Holy Spirit sustainer. Let us pray. <clears throat> 